this is a lecture co-sponsored by the School of Architecture and the School of Landscape Architecture and Climate at Papua. Uh, for this, so I'm going to step on screen and I chair the you know, committee uh, along with uh, Oscar Lopez, Bob Perkin, Eric Weber, and two students, Alfred Casella, and Holly Lettender. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge their work, all my put together all of the and publishers. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and the territories of indigenous peoples. And today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Odom and the Yaki. And committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign organizations and indigenous communities. And on behalf of Papua, I can now access to these communities and their elders of the Southern Ocean. Really pleased to gather today. Hopefully, if my introduction concludes, there will be more people who uh, find their way to the lecture hall. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I want to let you know about a couple of upcoming events. So, next Wednesday, at the same time, uh, we'll be having a double feature at 5 30 in this lecture hall. Assistant Professor and Chair of Architecture at the American University of Town Penn and visiting Fulbright scholar Stefan Kosh will lecture on the work of Van Molilan. Molilan was Cambodia's first fully qualified architect and responsible for new era of Cambodian post colonial architecture, referred to as the new Timer architecture. Fabulously brutalist, wonderful stuff. So come have a look. And following the lecture, uh, which will include participation of members from the Ben Molinan Project and the New Timer Architecture Group, we'll head over to the Sunk Gallery to inaugurate the exhibition of Van Molinan's work, which is the first outside of the Asia Pacific region and also the very first period of his work in the United States. Uh, the exhibition will be up and visible in the gallery during business hours through April 15th. Uh, so please join us for the talk, the exhibition, and the opening reception in the exhibition. We have two additional talks to look forward to in April. On the first, Monica Ramirez Andreota on cultivating science, baptism, and action through participatory research methods. That will be online. And on April 6th, uh, Sigrid and Jansen of Princeton University will be speaking on extraordinary mechanics and structural innovation in architecture that will be in place in here in this lecture hall. So you can find more information about uh, those events, their speakers, and registration for any of these events on our website, capital.arizona.edu, and there is these events. So I'd now like to introduce my colleague, uh, tonight's speaker. So this might be a little formal, but good to honor our speaker this evening. So Dr. Harley Atkins earned his PhD from Portland State University and a master's degree in city planning from UC Berkeley. And prior to joining Papua in 2013, Dr. Atkins previously worked in the planning department at TriMax, which is the transit agency for the Portland, Oregon region, and for FlexCar, a pioneering, a pioneer of car sharing in North America. Associate Professor Harley Atkins now chairs Papua's urban planning graduate program, and since 2018, he also holds an appointment in the Health Promotion Sciences Department within the now and Enid Zuckerman College of Public Health at UNA. Dr. Atkins' research focuses on understanding the interconnectedness, transportation equity, affordable housing, and various health and safety uh, disparities related to urban transportation systems. In particular, his research addresses transportation systems' health and safety disparities, 
applicability of standard measures of walkability in different socioeconomic and socio-cultural contexts, and the role of affordable housing in providing access to neighborhoods that support access to opportunities and physical activity. ISIM was co-PI on the CDC-funded Physical Activity Policy Research Network Collaborating Center at EA, and his research has been funded by the Federal Highway Administration, National Institute of Transportation and Communities, and the Center for Reducing Foreign Rental. His research has been published in many journals and many volumes, including Health in Place, the Journal of Urban Design, the Journal of Transportation and Health, the Journal of the American Planning Association, Housing Policy Debate, the Journal of Public Transportation, and the Journal of Urban Health. I also want to acknowledge Charlie as an extraordinary collaborator and colleague who always helps keep us focused on the processes as well as the outcomes. Something I can share with you. So please welcome Dr. Thank you, Beth. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I'm not. Um, tell me if I, if I start yelling, let me know. Cover your ears. Um, really wonderful to be here, Beth. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, I was just commenting to Christopher Dolan that we, we don't have enough opportunities to do this. Um, to, Talk amongst ourselves. I think sometimes here at Capitalist, um, share the research that we're doing. Um, I think that the intro that you heard touches on uh, many of the things I'm going to be I've sort of shoehorned into this talk. Um, I came up with the title several months ago, and it's been a bit of an exploration putting this talk together. Um, and as you'll see, I, I've kind of gone back in time a little bit. Um, so one of the things I'll be talking about is is a bit of my journey and how I have sort of shifted my thinking in the ways that I would interact with and work in practice. Um, and you'll even get to see a, an old picture of me from over a decade ago. Um, so really uh, fantastic to be here, um, especially in person. I don't think I've given a public talk in person like this in the last two years. Um, the first time I haven't been to wear sweatpants under, underneath the, the, the jacket. So um, grateful for that as well. Um, let's dive in. So, I'm not a designer. Um, I am an urban planner with a background in transportation planning. I have published in the Journal of Urban Design, um, and I think a lot about how the ways that we design and build our cities impact the ways that people live. Um, so, as you've heard from Beth, a lot of that uh, related to health and safety disparities related to our transportation systems, uh, but then also looking at the way that Different neighborhood urban form, as well as urban design, impacts the way that people experience uh, their, their neighborhoods and their homes. So, again, my background flex car, um, you know, back in 2002, I think it was, um, a, a new concept. Um, this was long before Uber and Lyft were even ideas in any, anyone's head. Um, and we were just cars that were parked around the city that you could access if you were a member um, and use them. The idea was this would give people access to a car who either didn't have access to one, or maybe they wanted to get rid of a car, live more of a car for your lifestyle, but still wanted to be able to go to Costco on the weekend um, if you could use one of these cars. Um, so it's really, it's been interesting to reflect on, you know, this was, this was 20 years ago, um, and how much things have changed uh, in the ecosystem of transportation and technology. Um, we had cars, we had all kinds of technological problems with them. It was very basic. There was this little computer, uh, you know, bigger than a cell phone, tapped under the floor. Uh, and that was how the system worked. All kinds of problems with that. So it's just incredible to me to think about how far we have come. And there have been both positives and some real challenges with those advancements. So then working at TriMet, um, the Innovative Transit Agency in Portland, Oregon, master's degree at Berkeley, and then PhD at Portland State. The motto of Portland State, as you can see here, let knowledge serve the city. And I share this because in my work, and I think something that I really try to instill in those that I work with, with students, with collaborators, is really tying research and practice together. 
Um, and that's also can be more challenging than we think. Um, but I hope that you'll see um, for those of you who are on a, a practice track going out there to be architects, planners, landscape architects, um, you'll see some takeaways for practice in this presentation. And actually, let me take a quick pause there. How many would identify as architects or assume to be architects? Urban planners. Okay. And landscape architects. All right, so we've got the bases covered. Real estate development, anybody? I don't think so, based on who I'm seeing, but okay, that's good to know. A lot of my work focuses on the concept of walkability. Um, this is something that we get gets thrown around a lot um, when we're talking about urban design and urban planning. Uh, but what is it? Um, essentially, just according to Wikipedia, which I looked up this morning a measure of how friendly an area is for walking. Michael Southworth, uh, urban design scholar at UC Berkeley, has a slightly more complex uh, definition. The extent to which the built environment supports and encourages walking by providing pedestrians comfort uh, and safety, connecting people with varied destinations within a reasonable amount of time and effort, and offering visual interest in journeys throughout the network. So why does walkability matter? There is vast evidence um, that walkable places do facilitate more walking. And we know that more walking has benefits in terms of human health, the environment, economic, um, and, and also social um, aspects of our communities. So it's a very important concept to be thinking about. Um, everyone, um, each of you, I would guess, uh, be almost certain, has been a pedestrian at some point today. Um, this is a big part of our lives and often something um, that gets overlooked in transportation conversations. Okay, so let's unpack this a little bit more. Um, so when we look at walkability, we're looking at an area, even Wikipedia knows this. Um, so we can look at this at different scales. We can be looking at neighborhood scale. We can be looking at regional scales. Um, we can be looking um, on a campus like this. Um, so we need to be thinking in those different scales. Pedestrian comfort and safety, we start to look at things like infrastructure, um, but also the way that that infrastructure is designed, the way that it interacts with buildings around it in terms of urban design. Connecting people. Varied destinations. So we start thinking about land use. Um, what people have opportunities to walk to is really important in this concept. A reasonable amount of time. This means things need to be fairly close together. So we have to think about things like density in terms of how we build our cities and our neighborhoods. And then this idea of visual interest. Um, so there is an aesthetic component. Um, this is a topic we'll get we'll back to sort of what that aesthetic component means. And it can be a really tricky one, and I think a really dangerous one um, to interpret for our professions. And then back to this idea of a network. So again, we have to have connections. Um, to the larger transportation system. So when I was in grad school, this was a paper that I read that I um, was really, um, I would say, influenced by um, for quite some time. Um, so this is, um, so reviewing Susan Handy, you can read the rest, but some really big names in the urban planning field. And what they did is they identified, you know, they went through, um, literature from Kevin Lynch um, to more contemporary stuff um, and identified um, these aspects of urban design qualities. And I'm not gonna go through all of these. Some of you have maybe come across these in a, in a, in a class. Um, there are different uh, urban designer and thinkers and scholars who have come up with different versions of this list. But here, just as an example, this is this idea of enclosure. Um, so that you can you know, sort of find a space, people are more comfortable um, walking through an environment like this. Um, and you see these terms uh, repeated in design guidelines for different cities. Um, you see them replicated in other research, as we can see here. So just directly from this group of authors, um, after this initial paper, they wrote a book. They wrote an illustrated field manual. They wrote multiple papers. 
Um, you know, some of these papers have been read thousands of times. And again, these are very influential in terms of being having carryover in, into practice, um, especially on the sort of urban planning overlap with urban design. So this is me in probably 2000, gosh, 2009, maybe. Um, and what I'm doing in this picture is explaining to this group of volunteers and to the critics in the neighborhood principles of urban design as seen through the articles that I read about the past in that person. And I think you're also seeing in my head here some gears turning and thinking, wait a minute, these things don't necessarily translate all that well. They push that to the people that I'm talking to. Um, and as you'll see, some, some research that we were doing in a very specific neighborhood context, showing us that these urban design principles, the way that they were explained in these various design manuals and guides, didn't quite hold up. So this prompted some real questions in my mind. So this work was funded by the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and we were looking um, to understand how elements of green streets and green infrastructure um, might have a secondary benefit in terms of improving an area's walkability in terms of some of these urban design components. And we found that, that in, in fact, they did. They, they, they did um, seem to increase the attractiveness of a, a, a space for pedestrians. Um, and we did this. The reason I'm training these volunteers is that we were out having them do an audit of an entire neighborhood where they would look at every street segment and rate it on all of these different measures. Um, but I remember very clearly explaining this idea of enclosure um, and realizing that all the examples that I had seen of good enclosure in urban design were all from fairly wealthy middle class or higher income levels. Um, and the examples that we were seeing in the context of this neighborhood were quite different. And therefore, the way that these areas were being viewed by the people that lived there, that walked there, were quite different. And then we were actually able to do a quick um, statistical test of this in the paper um, and basically showed that um, the correlation between the sort of expert rated um, uh, attractiveness in terms of urban design qualities um, and the user generated um, where it was fairly weak correlation. Um, so this uh, evidence of kind of giving us pause when we use some of these tools. So going back to this original paper that, that spawned a lot of the other that I mentioned, and, and the one that was quite influential early in my grad school days, let's look at the methods of what they said they were doing. Recruit an expert panel, shoot video clips of streetscapes, rate the urban design qualities of streetscapes by the expert panel, measure the physical features of streetscapes from the video clips, test inner rater reliability of physical measurements and urban design quality ratings, statistically analyze them, and then select the qualities that they want to operate. What's missing from this list perhaps based on what I just mentioned? Yeah, so this is, these are based on expert ratings. And they have a list of who the experts are, and they're all you know, big names in the field. I think Michael Bowser from Berkeley is on that list of their expert panel. Um, but yeah, there's something missing here um, in terms of um, you know, checking um, to see how these, these, these work um, with people who are using these spaces. Um, and so this has been kind of a jumping off point, or turns out this was a jumping off um, for a lot of the research um, that I've continued to do um, since getting my PhD. So a book that some of you may be familiar with, um, but I would highly recommend, um, Landscapes of Privilege, just a couple quotes that I want to show you from here. Um, and I think that these are really important things, whatever field we're coming from, for us to remember about urban design. So taste is a form of cultural capital that people acquire often without knowing its origin. People from similar social and regional backgrounds develop common sensibilities and aesthetic appreciations. Shared taste is mobilized as the basis of group belonging 
and equally as the basis of social distinction or exclusion. Some images are widely shared. However, fine distinctions within the discourse and are used to establish the status of some and to exclude others. When we are planning cities, when we are drawing up urban design of what a place is going to look like, we cannot disconnect that from what's being talked about here. Um, we do need to recognize that design, as well as policy and planning, um, can be used as tools of exclusion and, and very often have. Um, so we just need to always be cognizant of this. Um, and here, this other this idea, um, again, of how these practices um, have been tools um, um, to create or stabilize the association between landscapes and particular desired social identities. Um, and if you dig into the history of urban planning, um, of architecture, of any of our fields, you're going to find very problematic examples of this. So a uh, lesson from that little intro there is that people do not experience urban spaces the same in the same way. Um, and we cannot plan and design cities as though they do. And let's get into some, again, we're doing kind of a, a What's the movie? Uh, Dickens Christmas Story, right? Where he's visited by the ghost of Christmas past. And so that's what I feel like a little bit with this talk. We're going back through some of my um, Christmases past in terms of, of research. So this was a study um, uh, right towards the end of my PhD, um, right when I got to the University of Arizona. Um, a study where we looked at, at, at whether or not drivers were exhibiting signs of implicit racial bias when stopping or not stopping for pedestrians and cross um, And this was the first study of its kind. And we found that uh, black pedestrians um, had to wait longer and were passed by about twice as many cars um, as white pedestrians. Um, and this was an experiment where we, um, we couldn't just go out and observe this. Um, we um, actually hired people to go out Essentially, the actors to cross the street. Um, we trained them how to cross the street. Um, we dressed them the same so that we were really trying to sort of isolate um, the impact of skin color, of race um, on uh, driver behavior. Um, and this struck a nerve, you know, got a lot of national and international media attention. I share this one, I think it's a, uh, uh, what is it? Flemish. It's not, I think it's from Belgium, so not Dutch, but Flemish. Um, and it's kind of fun to hear yourself get quoted in such, a, such an odd language, which I do not speak. Um, but anyway, this, this study um, further sort of solidified in my mind um, people are not experiencing the transportation system in the same way. Um, and we know that there are disparities in terms of safety outcomes um, based on race. Um, we don't think that this explains a lot of that. There's a lot of other things going on, but this can certainly contribute not only to safety, but also people's perceptions um, of safety. Um, and as you'll see in a second, people's perceptions of how they're just treated by society. So we followed this up with a series of focus groups with black pedestrians in Portland. Um, and I should say, um, Portland is a place where drivers are pretty likely to stop for pedestrians at stoplight. Um, unlike some of my experiences here in Tucson. Um, so we were, you know, do things vary by, by region, um, but even in a place where people are fairly likely to stop, we were seeing sizable differences, um, again, between black and white pedestrians. So here from these focus groups, I just want to share a few things that we heard. Um, we were not specifically asking people about um, the study, um, but we were just asking them about their experiences of walking um, in Portland, and a number of them did bring up crosswalks. Um, so here's someone talking about um, standing at an intersection waiting to cross, um, and a white person coming up uh, on the other side of the street and cars suddenly stopping. Um, here, 
we have someone reflecting on whether race factored into how drivers treated them. Um, so this person said, no, I do because when I had a white partner, they would stop a lot more often than when I was by myself or with a black person. So yes, race has something to do with it. They don't see us like human beings like they are. They think that we're second class citizens. So when I'm crossing the street, I do see a lot more negative experiences and they don't wanna be inconvenienced or stop when they are supposed to. We then asked um, for a follow-up question um, to this participant of the focus group um, about how this felt. Um, I would think that it was effed up, but I'm not going to lie. It was also a privilege because I didn't have to worry about me getting out there and stopping the car, me getting out there and going off. Like my partner was very quick to do that stuff. So it was like, I can breathe. That's kind of messed up too, but it was nice to breathe sometimes. So these are not experiences that we hear enough about. Um, but I think that these are reasons that we, as design professionals, need to be out there talking to people, um, talking to people about the work that we do, um, and really understanding this very specific context uh, of how people are experiencing space. And then here is another one. I'm not going to read through this one. Um, it needs time. But talking about some strategies um, that um, our focus group participants were using to not stand, stand out um, in relation to police. Um, so there's a, quite a bit of mention of police, um, but here in terms of talking about clothing, talking about trying to blend in. Um, and and I, I think I'm, I'm really touched by the last part of this where um, you know, the woman talking about um, the, the messaging to her son and sort of training her son to be careful in these same ways. We also heard people talking about, and this again, we were not asking about neighborhood change in this situation, but it's something that we've heard about in these focus groups, asking about walking. Um, so again, people feeling that um, as these places changed, um, they were uh, being ex excluded in different ways. Um, and I don't know if anybody's seen the movie Get Out in here. Um, highly recommend it. Um, but if you have seen it, um, the, the last couple of quotes here might resonate. So are these differences that we're seeing in some of these studies captured in urban design practices and metrics? Um, I think traditionally, this is an area where we have really struggled as a profession, but I think we are starting to see some change. Um, some of the work that, that we did, um, so me and my collaborators at, at Portland State um, was picked up both in the um, Portland uh, pedestrian plan, as well as uh, LA's Vision Zero planning documents. Um, and we are seeing, starting to see more. Um, there's some work right now being done to create some design guides specifically for um, um, communities of color and, and acknowledging um, that design is not colorblind. Um, and we need to be thinking about these things. Okay, so then, Launching into another project here. Um, this was the CDC funded project of a physical activity policy research network. Um, so U of A, um, I was the co-PI of one of five um, funded centers across the country. Uh, and the focus of our center was really trying to understand barriers to walking and physical activity in the context of predominantly uh, Hispanic, Latino, or Mexican American. Uh, neighborhoods in Tucson and other cities in the Southwest. So our first step was to go look, at, do a systematic review of research that has been done on the topic of understanding how walkable environments influence behavior. So are walkable environments getting people to walk more? And by and large, the answer is yes. And the assumption has typically been, if we create more walkable spaces, if people move from a not walkable place to a walkable place, they will walk more. But we looked at this in a way um, that allowed us to unpack it a little bit more. So one of the things we noticed right away, looking back at research going back to the 90s, um, is that standard measures of walkability have largely been defined and validated 
um, based on evidence from white middle class contexts. We saw, especially early on, that study areas were intentionally selected to try to uh, isolate the built environment effect by picking neighborhoods that were like each other. So we want to compare a not very walkable white middle class neighborhood to a highly walkable white middle class neighborhood. Um, and you can see from a scientific perspective, um, if they're trying to kind of prove this causation, why that would be done. But there was a lot missed uh, in that approach. And then in other cases, race, ethnicity, income would be statistically controlled for in these models, but there was very rarely any effort to understand um, those components as variables of interest. So they were controlled for and just kind of forgotten, and the researchers moved on. And again, in the context of the 90s and early 2000s, um, the, the real interest was providing evidence so that the federal government and local governments could be investing in creating more walkable transit friendly communities. Um, but in the rush to do so, things were missed. So we focused in on a subset of these studies that allowed us to go back, look at the data even if it was collected 15 or 20 years ago and to unpack whether the associations that were seen between walkability and walking vary depending on the socioeconomic and sociocultural context. We didn't have a lot of information, so we had to do this in a fairly blunt way, as you will see. Uh, and I'm gonna come back to that. So what we show here, and this, this is a reminder, probably not the most exciting thing we're looking at, but what we see here is the, um, basically the difference between an unsupported built environment, so a not walkable built environment, and a supportive or walkable built environment. And then we have the darker line is, This is based on income. So the darker line is the higher income groups. So we looked at studies that looked at income and race. What we're seeing here is fairly consistently, there is a stronger effect of a walkable built environment on the walking or physical activity. And MVPA is moderate to vigorous physical activity. Um, so we see differences in those relationships. And if we total all of these up across all the studies that we found, we see that for transport walking and for physical activity overall, the effect of a walkable place on walking or physical activity is 2.6 times as strong in places that were um, socioeconomically um, advantaged. Um, so in places that were higher income, in places that were more white. Um, so this shows that these assumptions that we have, um, if you ask most urban planners, they're going to tell you walkable places lead to more walking. We're showing that yes, that's true, but the effect of that is much, much smaller um, when we're looking at um, when we're looking at um, underserved communities. So back to this, there are two reasons that we we thought that this is happening. We're both seeing more walking in unsupported built environments. So what that means is that we have people who are living in a place, and we've got a number of these are Tucson, that are really awful, unsafe places for walking, but people are walking because they don't have a choice or another alternative. We're also seeing less walking in places that are uh, objectively walkable um, because we think there's something going on perhaps in terms of the social environment, but there are other barriers in terms of household characteristics. Um, it could be that um, people are working longer hours, working multiple jobs, don't have time um, to, to get the physical activity um, that would show up here. So is walkability just less important to some groups? Or are we measuring it wrong in some context? And I think very likely the latter. So the next stage of this project 
Uh, we were doing the focus groups here in Tucson, and we did it uh, these walking focus groups um, in four different neighborhoods in Tucson, where we would go out and walk with about eight people from the neighborhood, um, and we would use questions that we had prepared in advance, but also we'd use prompts from the built environment. Um, so we would get people to talk to us about how they were reacting to certain elements of the urban form of urban design. So we were surprised by the range of topics that we heard people talking about. Um, so, you know, conversation about walking very quickly turned into conversations about gentrification, conversations about social networks. Um, and this was very exploratory. We didn't know what we were going to find. Um, and we're really um, struck by the diversity of things that we were hearing. In one of the last focus groups, um, a woman that we had recruited um, the day before by sending one of our students um, up and down uh, 12th, uh, 12th, uh, yeah, 12th Avenue, um, who came, spoke very little English, um, and came with one kid in a stroller and holding one kid. Um, the type of person uh, who often doesn't, isn't able to come to focus groups or to public meetings. Um, so we were very, very thrilled that she was able to join us. One of the last things that she said in this last focus group, when we asked, what can the city do to make this place better for walking? She said in Spanish, talk to us like you are doing now. Um, so that was a moment that really shifted. This was a five-year CDC funded project. And that moment really shifted the rest of our work. And it was fantastic that we had a grant that allowed us that flexibility, which is not always the case. So we turned from there um, and really taking this woman's advice to heart. And we developed a methodology, um, some tools for going out and talking to people on the street and having systematic but very open conversations with people in their own terms, in the places where they're walking about what makes a place good or not so good for walking. So we um, looked at this point uh, sort of doubled the neighborhood we were looking at and included some that were uh, half, 75% or more of the neighborhoods were, sorry, half of the neighborhood were 75% or more in Spanish Latino, and half of them were 75% or more um, non Hispanic white. So we were able to make some comparisons. So we trained graduate students and community partners to go out and conduct these interviews in both English and Spanish. The questions were very open-ended because we wanted to hear what people were talking about in their own words. Um, if you're doing this kind of work using surveys, um, you may miss a lot of things because surveys are you know, really limiting you to just what, um, what questions you're, you're asking and what answer possibilities you're providing. So specifically, we wanted to avoid leading people talk about one particular aspect of the environment in which they're walking. So for example, the social environment versus the physical environment. So we did 190 of these on-street interviews in Tucson. Um, we've since done this also in Los Angeles and Denver, but we're still going through that data. Um, so of these, we went through these 190 interviews and we coded them for different things that we were hearing. And so what you'll see presented now, these are not, um, you know, we weren't people having people check what was important to them or not. Uh, these were just things that we found going through and reading the transcripts of these interviews. So lack of sidewalk, calm and quiet, lack of lighting, and you can see whether it's positive or negative. Lack of street crossing, aesthetic, sidewalk. So you were not hearing people talk about the specifics, you know, imageability or, or um, uh, enclosure. But here we're hearing people talk about some of those things that planners, urban designers care a lot about, aesthetics, infrastructure. I'm tricking you here a little bit because this is only half of the interviews. These are just in the predominantly Hispanic, sorry, non-Hispanic white neighborhoods. This is what we saw when we coded those interviews in these predominantly Hispanic Latino neighborhoods here in Tucson. Um, 
very different pattern of what we're hearing. We tended to see less emphasis on the physical environment, more emphasis on the social environment. And when we read about the social environment in terms of possibility, it's often focused on the negative. Um, and you will see that there was concern about crime in these neighborhoods. But we were also hearing a lot of mention of positive attributes of the social environment. People talking about social interaction, sense of community. So, 19% of the interviews had some mention of something related, related to sense of community in the Hispanic Latino context, 0% in the uh, non Hispanic white context. So, just some really striking differences, um, more so than we were expecting to see uh, in, in these results. And I think a question that we need to ask ourselves when we look at something like this is. If we are planners or urban designers, whatever our profession, and we're making decisions on this list, and we're not also thinking about this very different list of priorities, and of course there's overlap here, um, but we're missing something. Um, and I think we, we have, um, you know, potential to do some real harm um, if we are basing our priorities as we have uh, on sort of the, the, the lessons pulled from the wrong context, an ill-fitting context. Um, and so this is a, a paper published in the Journal of Transport of Health. And here, just really quickly, some of the things that we were hearing, um, and these were very short uh, interviews because we were on street, people needed to get on with their days. But we were again, very struck. These were in response to a question saying, what are some things you like about this area as opposed to walking? You wouldn't necessarily think that someone was gonna start talking about the history of the neighborhood um, or the cultural context of the neighborhood. Maybe we shouldn't be that surprised. Um, but I think we were, we were a little bit worried when we started this project, when we started these on street interviews, that everybody was just going to say, ah, fix the sidewalk, and then move on. Um, we were hearing all kinds of things. Neighbors look out for each other. And I should say that all of these examples are pulled from uh, the Hispanic Latino neighborhood context in Tucson. So some key takeaways from, from that uh, you know, multi-year CDC project um, are that traditional built environment indicators of walkability seem to be more aligned with how walkability was talked about in these non-Hispanic white locations, um, more emphasis on the social factors um, and also interactions between social and physical. Um, so when we would hear, it was very common, um, we would hear, um, you know, in all contexts, people would talk about having places to walk to, so that's the main thing, restaurants, shops. It was very common to hear in the Hispanic Latino context, these talked about in terms of it's a shop, but it's a shop that has been owned by the same family for generations and an old family friend, um, or the particular cultural significance of a particular location. We heard also here, I didn't get into it, but a complicated relationship. Um, and by complicated, I mean um, there were people who wanted more police, there were people who felt harassed by police, wanted less, but kind of a, a quite a bit of agreement around this idea that even those who viewed police presence positively wanted police to be doing different things, um, enforcing things that were going to make them feel safer walking, enforcing traffic from speeding um, and cars that weren't stopping for pedestrians at crosswalks, those sorts of things. So we found that these methods of on-street interviews were a very um, effective way to reach people. Um, and, and we were pleasantly surprised at how willing people were to talk to us. Um, and that we think that this approach can complement traditional approaches like surveys, 
and saturated audits um, to get at a sort of a richer source of information. When we started presenting this um, at conferences around the country and various cities, uh, we would often get people come up to us and say, how can we do this in our community? So we again took a pivot in the last year of this grant and decided to develop some tools that could help others do this. It's not rocket science. We were literally just walking up to people on the street um, and asking them some questions about, um, about the walking environment where they were. But we found that there was a real desire or a real appreciation for the systematic way that we had done this. Because decision makers in cities aren't always the best at just interpreting um, qualitative data. Um, so being able to have both that sort of qualitative richness of talking to people, but also um, being able to quantify by getting enough of these interviews um, people thought would be helpful in their communities. So we developed um, what we call the Qualitative Pedestrian Environment Data Toolkit. QPED. Um, this we, we put together a, a training manual, um, and and we we think that this could be a very helpful tool. This was launched at an event, and there was a lot of excitement. CDC was going to start using it for some of their um, as a recommended tool for some of their grantees. Um, this launched in February of 2020, um, so it very quickly became a bad time. To go up and talk to somebody on the street and get in their face. Um, so this has kind of stalled out for the last couple of years. Um, it has been used in a few locations um, just prior to that, um, but we're hoping um, that we can get some, some additional attention back to this issue. Um, some fantastic partners here, um, both here at the U of A, Public Health and CAPLA, um, as well as Living Streets Alliance, which some of you may be familiar with here locally in Tucson. And I'll skip over that. So the toolkit is the sort of on-street interview questionnaire. Oops. We developed a map component. So you can flip this over if somebody has a specific um, location that they want to talk about, they can mark that on, on the map on the back. And then this training manual step-by-step -step guide within the training manual, and then this website. So qped.org, um, again, hoping um, that we can get some more interest in this now that, fingers crossed, this pandemic seems to be going on. Okay, time check. Do you, it is 6.23. So I have a few more things slides I could do, or we could go to questions right now. So I've already thrown a lot at you. So let's go to questions. What's that? Do one more, do one more. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I thought that was to finish up. Dan the New Yorker, I thought was telling me to wrap it up. Okay, so the last thing, um, and this is a, the, the reason, the reason I ask is that this next, little bit that I want to talk about is I think really important, but it's also a bit of a departure from what I've been talking about. But it's it's context in another way. Um, so we often talk about the economic benefits of lawful delivery. And there's been a great deal of research showing that property values are higher. Um, there is less vacancy in commercial buildings and walkable areas. Um, we've and, and when improvements are made to an area to make it more walkable, um, there's stronger economic performance. So here are just some examples of that. Um, of course, when we have people willing to pay for an amenity like walkability or transit accessibility, um, and over the last 20 years, we've really seen an increase in demand for walkable transit accessible locations, what happens? Certain people are no longer able to afford living in that place because prices go up. And if we're not creating enough new walkable transit accessible locations, we have a scarcity of those things and the prices can go up very, very quickly. 
And we've seen this happening around the country. So we can go all the way back to my dissertation. And I was looking at um, people moving to new locations um, and how they make decisions about transportation in my dissertation. Um, so I was able to look at moves that happened prior to 2008, Great Recession, which a lot of real estate folks point to as kind of a turning point in um, sort of how the, the housing market and housing demand um, was, was shaped for certain types of neighborhoods. Um, so we showed that both, or I showed that high income and low income households were equally as likely if they wanted to move to a highly accessible place based on standard and walkability, they were equally as likely to do so. When I looked at the subset that moved after that time, 2008 and later, I saw this really striking difference. So high income, about 54% of those households were able to realize that preference versus um, almost exactly half um, the, the, the rate for the low income group. Um, so something was happening here. Um, and this was not, this was not the main, um, the main thing I was exploring in my dissertation. But again, it was one of those things that stood out to me. Um, and I think, you know, the first time I kind of looked at this when I was looking through the, soft, the statistical software I was using um, really shook me. And I think has, has influenced a lot of the research that I have done since. So another project, this was one teaming up with the Housing authorities in the, the Portland metro area. Um, we looked at data on where people with housing choice vouchers, these are Section 8 vouchers. Um, so it's essentially uh, a subsidy um, for low income households to be able to um, bring the cost of their rent down to about a third of their income. And what we found in Portland, in gosh, this was 20 probably 2011, 2012. So there's a very pretty hot housing market, a place with tremendous demand for these highly walkable, accessible locations. And what we saw is when people with housing choice voucher, uh, housing choice vouchers moved, they were seeing a 20% decrease in transit frequency at their new location, a decrease in jobs available by transit, and a decrease in local job density. So they were moving. We don't know why. This was just based on data of where they were. So we were not interviewing them. We were not surveying them. Um, but these numbers are so striking um, that it's not just by chance um, and probably not by choice um, that people are moving to less accessible locations. Also, because, like I said, this coincided with uh, a time where prices for those highly accessible locations were just skyrocketing. I think we've seen similar things and we would find similar patterns in cities all across the country. So what I'll leave us with today is a little, a little question. This is something I like to pose when I'm talking to audiences of transportation people. So let's look at four cities, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Vancouver, British Columbia, and Portland, Oregon. So not by accident, there's a lot of transportation stuff happening here. So I pose the question, and I'll pose it to you. What is different about these urban scenes? And it's really just a rhetorical question, but when I ask this to a transportation audience, you can imagine them. They're shouting out things about the bicycle lanes. Um, they're talking about differences in terms of our European friends in the clothes aren't wearing bicycle helmets. <laughs> Much more likely to see that in North American cities. Lots of transportation differences that we can point out. So this won't surprise you based on what I've just been talking about. But I would argue that one of the most important contextual factors here that is absolutely critical when we're thinking about the urban design, when we're thinking about the infrastructure. Is that in Amsterdam, around half of housing is somehow publicly controlled, or not necessarily public, but public or nonprofit. 
So it is not tied just strictly to the ebb and flow of the housing market. In Copenhagen, it's also about 50%. By my best estimates, that's about 24% in Vancouver, and in Portland, about 7%. I would expect Tucson to be no higher than where Portland is on this number. So what does this mean? To me, this means that we need to be very, very careful when we are taking lessons from these other places, whether it's related to transportation, whether it's related to urban design. Because we know that making a place more desirable is going to increase the demand for that place. That can be a good thing. If we're doing enough of that, that can be a good thing. We want to make places that are safer. We want to make places that are more comfortable. But if we're only doing that in a limited amount, which given the state and history of US cities, we're not able to snap our fingers and transform entire cities, we're going to be creating inequities as we make these improvements. When we look at Amsterdam and Copenhagen, um, where you know hundreds of, of US planning students, urban design students go every summer to learn from these places. We need to be thinking about these housing numbers. Because if they can afford to increase the value by adding these amenities, by making these sort of urban paradises that we all like to learn from. But they can do that in part because their housing context is so different. If 50% of your housing is not going to respond in that same way as we increase the value of property, you're much less likely to be excluding people as you make those improvements. So somewhat contentiously, um, I like to remind people that it's really dangerous to selectively borrow lessons from places like Amsterdam and Copenhagen, the urbanist paradises, without factoring in how transportation and urban design driven success stories are rooted in vastly different this is also not to say that Copenhagen and Amsterdam don't have problems with displacement, that they don't have problems with housing affordability. They do. They have more tools in their toolkit to be able to address it. So again, when I'm talking to transportation people, I like to close by saying we know that transportation is place-based. How we get around is largely dependent on where we live what type of neighborhood we live in. But then we also know that place is housing based. You can't take advantage of an urban amenity if you can't afford to live within an hour of it. So affordable housing is a prerequisite for equitable urban design and infrastructure planning it can never just be an afterthought. And this doesn't mean that all of you need to go into affordable housing development as a career. I think what it means is that whatever you go into, whatever you're currently working on, don't forget this housing context. Uh, because it is, I think, the sort of critical issue of our day. I shouldn't say the critical issue. There are many critical issues of our day, but it's, it's right up there. Um, because I think that it touches on racial and economic justice. It touches on climate justice. Um, housing is, is at the center of so many of these. So with that, I will say thank you for listening to my um, journey, uh, and I really uh, welcome the questions that you might have. Thank you. Great question. So the question, how do we define affordable housing? Um, the standard measure, um, which turns out there's not a lot of basis um, in, in science for it is, is about 30% of homes income. Um, but we do know that um, you know, we see a much higher share of a household income, a lower, a lower income household income going to housing than we do higher income. Um, and when we factor in transportation, which is the second data 
Um, usually we're trying to look at kind of a 50% of income being spent on housing and transportation within the threshold for affordability. So the 30%, that's what um, the so HUD um, for the, the, the housing vouchers, um, the amount is based on bringing the cost of housing down to 30% of, of the housing income. Choosing to walk for those, for those reasons. Um, so, and then the challenge is if we go in and make these improvements in those areas to make it safer, um, what is that going to mean? And, and is there an area where we have housing transportation um, and sometimes responding to the investments that are being made in the transportation? So, it really is um, it's a vexing problem. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that we, we don't want to assume that these these say healthy behavior, um, these environmentally friendly behavior are always going to be positives for the person doing. Yeah. Um, I guess where do you see the Tucson or do you see Tucson at all making um, progress? Like where specifically in Tucson do you know they're like projects or specific things that we're working on? Yeah, so City of Tucson is really um, trying to make up for, for a lot of time. Like I said, there's a lot of areas in the city that some of that here in walkability standpoint have been uh, neglected. Um, so there's there's a, uh, a new transportation plan uh, called Move Tucson um, that I would encourage you to check out. There's conversations happening about how to fund some of these projects. Um, but we are seeing more investments in sidewalks, more investments in bicycle infrastructure, um, some transit investments. Um, but this is a this is part of the challenge here is that because so much of Tucson was developed um, sort of post 1955 um, in this very hot of country era that we're still in, um, we don't have some of those 
more dense, more walkable, accessible neighborhoods that a lot of older cities would. Um, so it's, it's, it's very challenging um, to, to be able to retrofit. Uh, and there's a lot of great work out there, um, examples of sort of suburban retrofits that can make places uh, more walkable. Um, but it takes tremendous investment to do so. Yeah. It's really great to hear more, you know, just not the you share your work in here in this setting. Um, and you know, the other I'm thinking of the other affordable program, housing, transportation, and jobs. Right. Um, in this process of design, trying to put it work. And I'm just wondering how you know you're thinking about uh, uh, either the methods or the impact of policy on other people's jobs. Um, you know, with the pandemic has Right. Yeah, so it's, it's a great question, and not something I've given a huge amount of thought to. Um, so I'm not going to answer it in a random that way by giving another example. Um, so, with, with jobs, we often think about commuting, of course, in terms of transportation in a sense. Um, public transit is often kind of the, the it's primarily a commuting tool in a, in a lot of instances. Um, those are the types of trips that people are most likely, uh, commuting trips are more, most likely to be on. The, yeah, the, a commuting trip is more likely to be on transit than a trip to the grocery store, let's say. Um, and we have seen cities around the country really invest in rail transit over the last 20, 30 years. Huge investments, um, and and they've seen real response to that. Um, you know, we forget the last five years. Um, there was a period where transit riders and transit ridership was increasing in a lot of cities, partly because of these investments. Over the last five years, even before the pandemic, a number of cities started to see a pretty steep drop in ridership, even on these rail systems that they've invested billions and billions of dollars. So several transit agencies have conducted some studies to try to understand why that's happening. And one of the things that they're finding is that as they have invested in these um, transit rail transit systems that are largely in urban areas, they have seen redevelopment happening in those places. They've seen property values rising, which is often one of the stated goals of investment in rail transit is to induce development around them. But what they're seeing is that lower income households who need to live in their neighborhoods, who have been the most loyal transit riders for decades, are no longer able to afford to live in places near those transit stations. So they're having to move out to places that are not as well served by transit. So overall, we're seeing a drop in ridership. So the people moving into these um, more expensive housing units who have higher incomes want transit there as an amenity, but they're not necessarily the people that are going to use it every day to commute to jobs. Um, so it's a huge challenge in terms of access to jobs, um, the way that um, the distribution of poverty across cities is shifting. Um, so we're seeing a lot more um, Poverty in kind of inner ring suburbs, where so kind of seeing some some reversals where inner city areas used to have more poverty and now that's switching. So that, in terms of where people can access jobs, how people can get to those jobs in terms of transit, but also where social services, where schools are located, um, we're seeing these big shifts. Um, and again, it's a, it's a real challenging one that that um, is going to require a lot of work over the next. Thank you. 
well, where light is viewed as something that creates heat. This area um, primarily is starting to recognize the reason. So it's a low light city, and that is because it has all these other benefits, um, but also as a woman, you know, sensitive around gender identity, so it's just being able to uh, talk at night and uh, be interested in, in what we're seeing and what we've heard and what we're seeing again from from the there's a great question, and, and I'm glad you're noticing one of the things I noticed when I moved down here from, from Portland. Uh, this is a very, very poorly lit city um, in a lot of ways. And, and I hear people talk about the, what is it, the, the what's the word, dark, dark side of the city or something like that. Um, and I'm not an expert in this, so I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but I think that sometimes that is used as an excuse. For not, there are ways to light our city better that don't contribute badly to light pollution. Um, so I, I think that there are ways around that um, from my little understanding about light. We did hear, um, I can't remember exactly what the number is, but we did hear, hear people talking about lighting. One of the limitations of the approach that we were using, we were out talking to people during the daytime. Um, so again, if we're using the Prompts of the built environment or the environment around people, um, because we weren't talking to people at night, I'm guessing lighting didn't come up as much as it would have otherwise. Um, but I think it's huge. I think it is one of the reasons that Tucson has a fairly high, um, one of the reasons Tucson is a very dangerous place for pedestrians has to do with this lighting combination. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that there is a gender component to it. Um, and I, I think it's an area where we need to be investing uh, more. So, and if anybody knows more about whether I'm wrong about um, our ability to improve sort of street scape pedestrian scale lighting without contributing to light pollution, then I'm happy to be corrected, but that's always been my contention. Thanks, Jamie. Well, can I throw a question back out at the audience really quickly? I won't pick on any one in particular. A number of you are architects. I'm not an architect. I confess that I'm not a designer. So I'm just thinking about urban form and urban design. And, and this talk is clearly not geared towards architects, but I'm just curious if there were things that you thought from the work that I've shown that could be useful in architecture practice, whether it's sort of that urban design set of architecture or just architecture practice is part of it. Or not, feel free to say, eh, I don't know. Well, I asked a question about affordable housing. I was more asking how do you do it? How do you actually create and put it in place and that to make affordable housing? Just more. Right, right. Partially a planning, 
would that look like if when that light rail corridor went in, we spent even a fraction of that in the same corridor on transit? So what if it was $3 billion on transit and an additional billion dollars on affordable housing? What if we normalize spending that kind of money on housing? Um, would we do it without that in mind, really, on the transit project? Um, and I think we need to be careful about pitting the two against each other um, in the same way that we can't just, and I tell my students this all the time, we can't just throw up our hands and say, ah, oh, we can't make a safety improvement for transportation in your neighborhood because that might increase property values and displace people. We still need to make the improvement. It's not acceptable that people are dying on the street. We need to be working with the people who are doing the housing. We need to be working with the funder to make sure that we can 